Mic check, one, two. Hey, everyone. Thanks for uh, being back here from lunch. I want to say thank you to JS Fest and CSS Comp Oakland, the organizers, Carolina and Michael, for giving me this opportunity to talk about something that I think is really fun and that I'm really passionate about. So let's see. <laughs> There we go. So there's a lot of really fascinating math behind the display of colors on the web. There's hue and saturation and brightness and then variables of this. And that is a whole talk in itself. But what drew me to designing for the web in the first place was that, first of all, I could use really vibrant colors. And second of all, that the web connects you to information and stories and people. So I want to talk today about the stories behind the hex values. So for a while, I have loved these two things separately. I love writing CSS code and making things look good on the web, and I love color. Um, I got really into namespace colors when I saw this project. It's called uh, Music for the Memphis Group, and it's this really cool, basically visual album almost. It's imagining of what the what this design group, the Memphis group, um, what the type of music they would listen to. And the background is all these different Memphis group patterns. And I like, I started tweeting at the guy who designed it and asking him how he did it. And he was telling me that um, the background is actually rendered all with SVGs, um, three different layers of transparent SVGs. And he was like, I use all CSS namespace colors for the colors. And this is something that I had heard of, but um, I had never really made much use of namespace colors like just by themselves. So I think everyone knows this, but just to make sure we're on the same page, when I'm talking about CSS namespace values, I mean when you're coding in CSS and instead of typing in the hex value, you can reference a set list of keyword, color keywords. I think there's about 147 of them. And um, the browser and everyone will know what you're talking about. So back to this project, I was talking to the creator of it and he was showing me the color chart that he used in order to make this design. And I got really inspired and wanted to make my own, but put it in rainbow order like you do. And um, when, while I was doing this, I spent a lot of time with the names. And I got really intrigued about where they came from. A lot of them are kind of quirky. Like some are, are really normal, but then some are really out there. Like I think on this slide we see peach puff and tomato. And um, I wanted to know more about how those names got chosen and who got to pick them. And I knew the story of one recent color edition. I think a lot of you do. That's Rebecca Purple. So most of you know this, um, but almost exactly six months ago, Eric Myers, a big writer about CSS and web standards, uh, his daughter, six years old, Rebecca, passed away after a battle with pediatric brain cancer. So in her memory and in their honor, a proposal was submitted to name 663399 after Rebecca and call it Rebecca Purple. So this is this really incredibly human moment a uh, touching story of naming of colors and a great moment in the history of the internet that really brings this color to life. And I was hungry for more stories like this behind the naming of the colors. And I thought surely there were more instances of why something was called papaya whip or mint cream or Gainsborough. Um, so I went hunting for more anecdotes. Um, I'll tell you what I found. The reality is a lot more tedious and sort of black and white and boring, but um, there's a lot that is revealed about the history of the web and the possibilities that lay ahead of us. So the first thing to clear up about CSS namespace values is that they're not CSS uh, original. Um, they were um, their web standard colors. And I think um, I saw in Brenna's slides a lot, like she uses them in SVG. They're, um, they're, they can be used across a lot of different platforms, which we'll get to. But um, they were originally descended from the X windowing system, which is a windowing system for bitmap displays common on Unix-like computer operating systems. So these were called the X11 colors, and they were first shipped in 1986. 
so this type of windowing system was one of the first graphic user interfaces to render things in window boxes. And so having these standard system colors were really important for the differentiation of different um, areas and sections and windows. The original late 80s list still had a lot of variation between monitors, so there was kind of an agreed upon set of names, but even within those, the different vendors would tweak the values for their particular monitor, so um, neither the names nor the values were quite standardized yet. Until 1989, we see the release of the fourth revision of X11 and most of the colors that we know today as web standard colors. So here is the beginning of the X11 color list. These colors were user tested and tuned originally to an HP monitor and graphic designers started to get used to them. So from there they were popularized by Netscape and then they started being widely used in HTML browsers and finally in 2011 I think SVG officially standardized them and then also in 2011 they were rolled into the CSS3 color module. So it took a while, but the usage in CSS3 is just the most recent tip of the iceberg for these standard web colors. Why did it take so long? That begs the question. There's a big gap between 1986 and 2011. Well, as we have already heard today, it takes a while for web standards to get rolled in. And it's normal for things to take, um, I think Tab said, like five years at the least. And also because apparently there are a lot better ways to incorporate named color values in CSS, which maybe you guys make use of. You can sort of define your own values, and if you really like a certain pink, you can call it George Pink or Project Pink, and then go from there. And so they're not necessarily needed. But I want to make an argument for using them because I think they're really great. Even though they're not CSS, I think there's a lot of good reasons why to use them. Um, they are time and user tested for accessibility. I was really nervous about this slide because I was like, I'm saying this, but I don't know how this yellow is going to look. It could really kill everyone's eyes, but it's going well. So <laughs> there you go. Um, because they were put through the ringer before at being added to the web standard list, we know that we can um, rely on them to be um, good looking on the, on the web and on monitors. So when you're writing code, you are obviously dealing with a lot of syntax and numbers, and I think it's so refreshing that you can just use the name, and they're not case sensitive. Again, they're recognized by all browsers, and they work across HTML and SVG, and they have really fun names. So I will highlight some of my favorite ones. We have Honeydew, Papaya Whip, Mint Cream, Navajo White. This was actually one of the first ones that I was scrolling through the list and I was like, what's Navajo White and why is it orange? <laughs> Cornflower Blue, Dodger Blue, Orchid, Antique White, Gainsboro, Saddle Brown, Peru, Ghost White. These are just a few of my favorite. So while it wasn't exactly a committee of people sitting around deciding to name something Gainsborough or Bone White, I did find out where these names came from. So in 1989, for the fourth revision of X11, um, this is when a big bunch of the colors were added, and one of the one of the contributors to this was Paul Raveling, and he got a lot of colors from Sinclair paint swatches, um, and a lot of the ones that a lot of the light and off-white colors were from Sinclair paint swatches. Sinclair Paints was a California area paint supplier and after these colors were added they were actually bought up by somebody and then bought up by somebody else and they're like completely devoured now. But um, I went digging on paint forums and somebody had a swatch book from the late 80s and you can sort of recognize some of these names, which is so cool. I'll, I'll highlight the ones that are like definitely in the web standard colors, but it makes sense because thinking about like what the goofy names are in these web standard colors, um, when you're naming paint swatches and you have to 
find six different ways to say light orange, you get really creative. So hence, papaya whip. You may have noticed that a lot of these colors which were using the Sinclair paint swatches, there are a lot of beiges and off-whites. So this is one of my favorite sections, but it does sort of beg the question, like, why do we have so many beiges? I don't know about you guys, but I, I maybe use a lot of grays, a lot of different, like, light or dark grays, but I don't really need that many beiges. Well, this is because um, there's so many options for different browser backgrounds when these were standardized in the late 80s and early 90s. This was so designers could find like the perfect beige for their desktop browser background. So another big chunk of them came from John C. Thomas naming a lot of the colors after Crayola 72 crayon box that he had on hand. Um, in scrolling through the list of the different names of Crayola crayons, you can recognize some that are definitely rolled in. I think I counted 39 that are definitely from this list. And this also makes sense because when you're looking at naming a lot of colors, it makes sense to reference a commonly held standard color nomenclature. So these are ones that are definitely from Crayola crayons. And then from there, there's light and dark variations. So adding colors actually seems to be a rare occurrence for web standards, considering we're still working off the list released in 1989. Besides Rebecca Purple, the names we have today were gathered from various defaults and more or less are the same. Even Rebecca Purple, which seems like an obvious opportunity for doing something nice and beautiful and human, um, why not name this color after this sweet little girl? But there was a big debate over this, over adding this, and it was added unusually quickly. I think um, in less than, I think it was like three months. Um, but this is because the creators of web standards take their responsibilities very seriously, which is really good, we want that. Um, but it also means that colors never get added to the standard list. And I just wonder, why should we stop there? Are we really cool with this? Or should we question the standard list and make it a part of web culture to expand this list of colors? I believe that color is one of the ways that we can make the internet more human and more fun. I think that default is boring, and I think so many websites seem to be generated from defaults. They have the same navies and grays and black and default bootstrap templates. So I invite all color lovers to think beyond the default, but I also challenge you to think about the color of the web. We have so many colors at our disposal, why aren't we using them? We have this great resource for trying tested colors, so there's kind of no excuse to just pick some of these and start experimenting. I think that's a the theme of today is experiment and be adventurous. Of course, we have to keep in mind accessibility, especially when it comes to rendering text. The W3C states that color should not be the only means for conveying information or prompting an action, but still, we should use more color. So I want to show you guys some examples of sites that are using color boldly and using it really well. This is a site for Pollen Midwest, and I think that this website really struck me because they use colors that I sort of thought were off limits, like this magenta and bright yellow. And they also use a wider color palette than I normally do. I think typically as a visual designer, I pick one or two accent colors and feel like I'm even pushing it at that. And then everything else I just let be neutral and kind of stay in the background. But they've used all of these really bright accent colors and because of the um, mastery of design, they pulled it off and still made it look really slick and professional. But to me, the site is really memorable because of its use of color and because of its color palette. So this is a portfolio for an Australian designer and also a really bold, nice use of primary colors and a bold color palette that I think makes this portfolio website, which we've all seen a million of, really stand out and really be nice. But you might be thinking, I have to work on serious things. I have to work on financial sites. And I have to make websites that make people feel secure about using it and doing business on the internet. I hear you. Um, 
the biggest projects I've done have, have been these types of projects for nonprofits dealing with financials and working with government websites too. And the default there is again to use like navy blue or blue or blue and gray and black. But my trick is to kind of find like the little instances where you can flip that out. And what I do a lot is use instead of that navy blue is like a, like a green. <laughs> like, like a blue green and then use illustrations as an opportunity to make things really beautiful and use e an even wider color palette because I think if you nine times out of ten if you come back with a beautiful design people are going to be won over by that so I say make it beautiful and don't ask permission to use pastels <laughs> so if there's one thing you take away from this talk I hope it's that uh, but seriously, we should have fun with color. Um, we should use these CSS namespace values and we should challenge ourselves to think beyond default colors and even push the standard list of colors. I want to make a shameless plug for my own CSS color chart. If you want to experiment, start here. Uh, but there's a lot of really great ones. There's a guy named Neil Orange Peel that has one that is definitely better than mine, um, but different. Um, but you have this link, so use that one. Um, these are some some references I used. I uh, owe a big thank you to Chris Lilly. He was actually super helpful in um, answering all my questions about CSS color specs and, and web standards. And um, thank you to Lexington Ladies Code Club and Lexington, Kentucky, who let me try this talk out, and to Code for America. Uh, which is a great place to work that lets you do such creative things with color, even when working with governments. And um, if you want to talk to me about being a fellow, please do so. Uh, thank you so much to CSS Conf Oakland. <laughs>